Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 20 Live today. Kim, Peggy, and I are so excited that you could join us. Our special guest today is Danica Barker, and her topic today is going about using Web 2.0 tools, specifically Twitter, and how to use it to teach Shakespeare in high school English classes. So I know you're going to enjoy this show. I've had a good chance to work through with Danica some of the details, and uh, she has a really exciting presentation for you today. Uh, one of the things I do like to tell you about is the resources that you'll be seeing today. I was mentioning in the pre-session show that uh, the chat goes by very, very quickly, and there's a lot of links and resources being shared, and Danica will be doing that as well. We do have a Classroom 20 Live binder, and I know that Peggy might have the link and can drop it into us in the chat for us so that you may look at it um, at your leisure. What you'll find is that we have have a comprehensive set of resources curated for you here. On the far right, Classroom 20 Life Resources tells you how to use our site and work through us with uh, gathering the information that you might need. Today's session is on the far left with Danica Barker, and the links that she's sharing today uh, are in the live binder, as well if there are links that you share in the chat that are appropriate to today's show, we'll be adding them as well. Just a reminder for those of you who are new that we do have a website, live.classroom20.com, and specifically the archives and resources page. And the link for the live binder will be on that page, as well as we post a link to the actual recording from Blackboard Collaborate. We have an audio file for you. We have an embedded uh, video file so that if you wanted to share it in your learning management system or someone else on your website, you're welcome to take it. And then we do, as well, post on that page a list of the resources in addition to uh, the live binder, so you can get access to that information at the same time. And Kim's going to be talking at the end of the show about getting the RSS feed so you can keep up to date with our shows. I talked about using the laser pointer, and this is the time for you all to do that. So you should have access to the tools. So on the left-hand side of your screen, there's a set of tools. The second one now is a starburst. You need to click on it. Hold your mouse down and locate yourself in the world. And if you can't make that work, then go ahead, please just type in the chat where you're located. Shambles, of course, is the first one on the map with Thailand. We have someone in Italy or anywhere, Europe, the United States. I know that I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario, and Danica is also another Canadian living in London, Ontario, which is about two hours apart. Someone from Honolulu, welcome. Long Island. Thank you. It's, it just gives us a good overview about where we're located. And again, it emphasizes that we do have a lot of global connections and the information we share can help each other. So thank you very much for, for that um, participation. I'm going to ask you to take part in some poll questions. If you recall, the poll feature is just under your name on the right-hand side. And tell us what your role in education is going to help Danica frame her presentation today. Are you A, a K-8 to teacher, B, secondary or post-secondary teacher, administrator, distance learning instructor, or other? So if you're an other and can't fit to the A, B, C, D, please just type it in the chat. I'm just waiting for everyone to post their results. And it's taking a minute here to publish the responses. So there we go. A few of us weren't able to get that uh, voting at, uh, option done. I think, I think one of the guilty ones. Most people here are secondary or post-secondary teachers. We have a few elementary, a few administrators, and some distance uh, learning instructors. So that will help uh, you, Danica, in deciding um, and focusing your presentation. Thank you very much. I'm going to move to the next poll question, which is, do you have a Twitter account? And if you do, please share your Twitter ID in the chat. So just thank you very much for changing the functions there. 
a green check if it's a yes and a red X if no. And I share something that some of you heard. My Twitter account was hacked this morning, so make sure that you have a good long uh, password to uh, ensure security on your site. And so, you know, maybe I'm telling everybody that that may be a really good discussion about how comfortable people are using Twitter. Twitter. So, Danica, you might have an answer for me. I'm just going to publish the results because I think a lot of people have voted on this. There we go. Um, most half of, half the people here, 54%, do have a Twitter account and they are busy sharing in the chat their Twitter IDs. So we're going to go to the next question now, the very last one for you today. Do you use Twitter to support student learning in the classroom? So this could be online or in, in a uh, physical face-to-face -face classroom. Could you please let us know if you are using them to support student learning? I think we've got almost a fair number of people have actually voted on this item, so we got a mix here. 35% belong to me who didn't vote, and 32% uh, are, and 32% are not. So interesting discussion, and I thank you all for participating in our poll questions. And now it's my opportunity to turn the presentation over in a minute to talk to Danica Barker. Danica is a uh, teacher in Thames Valley District School Board, which is in London, Ontario. Uh, as I said, some people are two hours from me. I've had the opportunity of uh, visiting with Danica last weekend at unplug.ca, and maybe it was two weekends ago. I've lost track of time. Um, she is an extremely uh, inventive and creative person, and I think it's going to shine here because she has an honors English degree. She's a Bachelor of Ed uh, qualified for Intermediate Senior English and History. She's an English Honors Specialist and currently a Master of Education student. As I said, she's been working for nine years with Thames Valley. She's been a teacher librarian and worked as a literacy uh, learning coordinator for the board. She has a, a lot of interests that I think are going to pop up. And I love the, she does tell me the one that she likes. Besides uh, new learning opportunities, she really likes shoes. Maybe she would want to share your advice about buying shoes, Danica. If there's something else that you want to add to uh, your uh, bio, please feel free to do that, Danica. But I am going to ask you, before we get too much farther, you can mix in your intro as you answer our newbie question, and I think uh, it'll be helpful for those people who are not using web tools, if you could tell them why you would use those tools to teach high school English. So welcome, Danica. Uh, we're so pleased you could be with us today, and the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Lorna. I'm really excited to be here today. I, am, I have to confess, I am a bit nervous, too. but. Uh, I, I do a lot of theater as well, and they say nerves is that's a good thing actually when you're you're going on stage or when you're presenting because uh, it's good for energy. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So there, there's another thing to add to my bio. Uh, I do a lot of theater too. Um, I'm actually in rehearsal right now for a production of Othello, where I'm playing Iago, who's the bad guy, and it's usually played by a guy, but we're doing a whole bunch of gender reversal in this version of the play. So. That's kind of Shakespeare's theme, too. Um, so the newbie question, why would you use Web 2.0 tools to teach high school English? Um, I think it's a really good question. And for me, though, uh, I would like to even you know, broaden it more and say, why would you use any particular tool to teach high school English? I mean, why use uh, a textbook? Why use uh, a specific poem? Why? use the blackboard. As far as I'm concerned, you know, all tools are fair game. It's um, how you use them and that you need to think about the purpose for using them that's important. So um, initially when I started using Web 2.0 tools in the classroom, my answer to that question would have been, uh, I use Web 2.0 tools because I think they're going to be an engaging hook that will almost bribe students into learning. So. <laughs> Um, and I thought, you know, I thought that would be that would be great. It's something that's new. It's something that's a novelty. So they'll be so hooked by the fact that they're using uh, something online that they won't even care that they're, uh, you know, doing some sort of specific English-based task that I've got for them. But 
one of the things I quickly learned as I was building in Web 2.0 is that it, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, is that it, um, if you don't have a clear idea why you're using it, if you don't have a good rationale that you can articulate to the students, then um, you may not be using it for the right reasons because that, that novelty factor wears off quickly and some of the kids are not comfortable actually with using Web 2.0 tools. Now, for me, that's not a reason not to use them, but uh, it's more of a reason why I should have uh, a specific goal in mind when I'm using a Web 2.0 tool. So one of the things that you're going to see today when I present on uh, using Twitter to teach Hamlet is that I actually did a little experiment first and played around with it because I thought it sounded really cool, but I didn't actually know what the kids would actually be able to do with this tool that they wouldn't be able to do with, you know, other tools that I would traditionally use in the classroom for teaching Hamlet. So um, I'm, I'm going to kind of go through the experiment that I did first before I get into telling you how I did this in the classroom. And uh, as the chat's going by quickly, I did see that somebody else has uh, used Twitter as well to teach Shakespeare. So hopefully we'll have some time to kind of share those and I would love to connect with you because um, so far, I'm the only person that I know of that's been doing it that I've, I've been able to talk to, so I'd love to talk to other people who have tried it. Okay, so um, let me just see. I guess I'm allowed to advance the slide now on my own, right? You have all the tools. Okay. Just up. Go ahead. I have the power. Okay, awesome. All right. So uh, the 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 title of this project, because I enjoy puns as many English teachers do, is Brevity is the Soul of Twit. So Twit for Twitter and Brevity, of the, Brevity is the Soul of Wit is one of the famous quotations from Hamlet. Now Marcellus, who's joining us here today, uh, is actually one of the people who participated in our very first experiment. A colleague of mine who I've known for a while on Twitter who volunteered to uh, help me out with the very first incarnation of this project. So he's got a lot of uh, a great input on this project as well. Um, and I hope that through this presentation you'll be able to see that it's not specific to Shakespeare. I'm going to be using um, uh, these concrete examples because I think it really helps to have concrete examples, but I hope that you'll be able to see how you can transfer this to other contexts. For example, um, I know a teacher who uh, teaches primary uh, grade one and has her students tweeting. Now those of you who, who know, of course, that Twitter has age restrictions and that sort of thing, they have a class Twitter account, so uh, the, the students didn't have individual accounts. But she's basically taking the same philosophy that I was using and applied it in the grade one context. So this really isn't specific to high school. Okay, so just an overview. I'll try to stick to this as much as possible, but I find that these presentations tend to be fairly organic and we'll go where, you know, if the mood takes us or where the desire for the room takes us. So as I mentioned, first of all, I'm going to talk about the experiment. So the thing to keep in mind is the experiment was one that I did with a bunch of my contacts on Twitter. Thanks for that link to uh, Aviva's Twitter account there, Marcellus. Um, so the, the experiment was done with a mix of teachers and just friends that I had on Twitter who volunteered to try this out with me so I could figure out how this would work. And I'll, I'll tell you what we learned from that experiment and how I then applied that to the classroom. Um, then I'm going to get into kind of the nuts and bolts of how we actually did this in the classroom. The first time I presented on this, I hadn't actually, um, I hadn't actually tried it in the classroom first, so it was all kind of hypothetical. So now I've actually done this twice. I did this once in first semester last year and once again in second semester of the, uh, last year. And uh, I learned how to kind of fine tune things and uh, figure out what worked and what didn't work. So I hope to share that with you today. And then by the end of it, I hope the thing that you'll understand is the thing that I was focusing on when using Twitter in the classroom was what did it let us do that we couldn't do before? Uh, I'm really focused on using Web 2.0 tools in transformative ways. So not just substituting. Um, I want to figure out what this tool lets us do, whether it's Web 2.0 or whether it's, um, you know, a face-to-face -face teaching strategy. What does it let us do that I can't do with other tools? 
And that's really my main philosophy with a lot of the things that I do in the classroom is choosing the best tool for the job. And whether that's a pencil or whether that's a computer, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's the same philosophy. Okay, so this screen right now is just a screenshot. It's static, but I'm going to uh, try my hand at the web tour thing. Um, because this was kind of a little teaser video that I made uh, for our first incarnation of Brevity as a solo twit. So I'm going to punch in the URL here and hit enter. And here we go. Worked. I'm not sure if that played at the same time, and is, is everybody back now? I haven't done that before. Yes, okay, all right. Um, so that's a Google search story, and I, I almost left that out of the presentation because as I went to do the, um, uh, the sorry, what was I trying to say here? As I went to do the presentation to give you guys the links, um, one of the things that I remember that uh, Lorna said to me is, this would be fantastic to show teachers so they can make their own. And then I just realized as I was going to put it in that it doesn't look like um, Google lets you do that anymore. So I'm really sorry. You can still make your own version of that though. It was pretty cool. So it was actually, uh, I didn't use a specific program. It was something that was within YouTube. Uh, and of course YouTube and Google are, are part of the same company. So it was, uh, it basically let you put in your search terms and it made the video for you, which was really, really cool. Um, and it basically made a video of all the search terms that came up. But I, it, it's not used, the URL at the end of it that says make your own no longer takes you to that. It takes you to something different. So I hope I haven't disappointed people by actually showing that. But I like using lots of sort of video teasers to kind of get students hooked on uh, different things. So. I'll, I'll make sort of welcome videos for my class and that sort of thing to give students a taste of uh, kind of what's to come and, and get students excited about it. So um, I did that for Brevity is the Soul of Twit. And there's lots of other multimedia that I'm going to talk about that we incorporated within it. Yeah, welcome videos are nice because on the first day of school, and I'm working on updating mine for this year, on the first day of school and uh, in Ontario, our first day is uh, September so we haven't started yet, but I really like to do, um, you know, the day beaten up by handing out a syllabus and talking about here are the books you need and here are the rules and uh, that's really dry. So rather than do that, I mean, I have to do all that stuff, but I like to kind of give the kids a video with some really energizing music to give them an overview of what the class is rather than just reading it off the syllabus. So uh, I do a lot of that kind of stuff. I do it with Hamlet too to get them hooked. So. Right now what I'm, I'm talking about is the experiment. Uh, this is what we were focusing on. Um, I had this kind of crazy idea over March break one year. That's our, our spring break up here in Ontario. And I thought it was inspired by a project that I saw that the Royal Shakespeare Company did that I will, um, I'll, I'll show you in a little bit, where they had a bunch of people role playing Romeo and Juliet in real time uh, in London, London, England. And uh, it was all done by, by real actors. And I sort of thought, well, you could, I mean, you don't really need to have seasoned actors doing this. Um, that's one of the kind of exciting things about Twitter is that the, there is some anonymity there. So you're not you know, in front of a bunch of people saying things out loud. Um, you can sort of uh, think about what you want to say and then say it. And so I thought as long as people are fairly comfortable with Twitter, or remotely comfortable with Twitter, and kind of know the play, that would be enough to get us going. So, um, and I thought that I wanted to do this in the classroom and I figured that uh, before I actually did this with my students, I wanted to be able to, to articulate to them what the value was in doing it. So that's why I did this with some of my, my Twitter friends first. 
and uh, and see what comes from that. So I won't spend all that Twitter is, is not gold. But it's so true, Gordon. Um, so I thought, you know, let's try this out first and then see what we get from it after. So I'm going to try not to spend too much time on this. I am going to do a little bit in terms of the basics of Twitter because we do have some people who are, are newer to Twitter. Um, and uh, I'm hoping though that I'll spend the majority of my time talking about how we actually did this in the classroom. Okay, so a little bit about Twitter first. Um, this is pretty straightforward. And I, I think that most of you do sort of understand how, how Twitter works, at least even if you haven't used it before. So um, one of the things that's important though, I think, is that it's not just about text-based posts. I mean, you can post text, but it also allows you to post links, which I think is something that's really, really cool here. And Peggy is posting some really good links just on the basics, how to start uh, signing up for Twitter and get going on that if, you, if you're if you not using Twitter right now. And I think it is important if you are going to try this in the classroom to use Twitter yourself so that you understand what the value is. And I do have, yes, Peggy's posted it, a presentation on Twitter that I've done for other teachers. It was specifically, I think, focused on developing a personal learning network on Twitter. There are lots of other good ones out there that other people have created too, though. And so again, this sort of just, and this is in the presentation, it goes over the basics of setting up a Twitter account. One of the things that I am just going to briefly mention, though, is if you haven't set up a Twitter account yet, um, it, I really would suggest using your own picture, um, and, and definitely at least using a picture, because one of the things, and, and Lorna was talking about the fact that uh, she got spammed today. Um, if people are, are deciding whether or not they're going to follow you and you don't have a picture, uh, some people think that you may possibly actually be a, a spammer. So um, I think it really helps. Uh, Marcellus has added a really good point here about one of the, the values of Twitter is by being forced to reduce the number of, of uh, characters in your tweet, um, it, it does actually help you pare your thoughts down to kind of the, the, the soul of wit, if you will. Some of the basics of connecting. So if you want to publicly connect with somebody else, you just type in their username with the at message in front. Uh, Shambles has mentioned about avatars to protect privacy, and, and you know that's a personal choice. And, and if that's something that you're concerned about and that you don't want to be on there publicly, um, using an avatar I think is totally fine. But it's just having the picture I think is the important part because just if you're an egg, if you appear as an egg when you first sign up for Twitter, people think you might be a spammer. Um, and uh, with the students, though, when I have my students tweet as characters, they use avatars. I mean, mainly because it, it helps them develop their character on Twitter as well, but also to help protect privacy. Um, and I talk to teachers and my students about uh, the difference between app messages and direct messages. Now, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but when we did our uh, classroom, uh, performance of Hamlet, we didn't use direct messages at all. I had access to all of their Twitter accounts, so if they used the direct message, it didn't really matter. But we talked about, since this was a performance, we wanted it to be public. So we talked about the difference between that. But uh, direct messages could be really helpful for connecting with other teachers, especially when you're, um, if you want to, you know, share contact information like email addresses, but you don't want that to be public. Because I think one of the things that's important that I do stress with students is that these messages that we're sending on Twitter are public, and so they need to think before they tweet. Retweeting. Um, my students did make use of this quite a lot, especially if somebody tweeted something they thought was really clever or funny, which is what we do on Twitter as well, or something that's interesting. So it's a way to forward interesting tweets or links to the rest of your followers. And there's some good stuff going on here in the chat about why you wouldn't necessarily want to use personal pictures for Twitter if you're a student. And I think that's all really good stuff. And hashtags. Um, there was a really great video that I used to use. I'm not going to use it right now, though, about what a hashtag is. Um, it was from the, our election, our federal election here in Canada, where uh, Jack Layton, one of, uh, one of our, my, my personal heroes in Canadian politics, who's passed away now, um, talked about hashtags in a political debate, and it had everybody very confused. 
So a hashtag is something that's really useful, and I think it's important that I explain at least what a hashtag is because my students went crazy with hashtags in their tweets. Um, it was something that was really sort of really appealed to them for some reason. But a hashtag is a way to uh, kind of tag or help you sort through different tweets. Um, so tweets that are all about, for example, this presentation might be hashtagged with live class 20 with that number sign in front of it. So you can actually on Twitter do a search for live class 20 and you can find all of the people who are tweeting about them even if, uh, thanks for those, even if you don't follow them. So that's something that's important to keep in mind as well. Um, my students also use them as kind of like a, a theme. So um, one, of the, one of the ones that they did all the time is the grave diggers in Hamlet said, had one that was called hashtag grave digger problems. And then right before that tweet, they would say something like, the bodies are piling up and there's only two grave diggers, hashtag grave digger problems. So they had a lot of fun with that. So they can be used in really humorous ways as well. So this is such tweet sorrow. And uh, I think that uh, maybe somebody will put the link to such tweet sorrow in the chat here if you want to check that out. Such tweet sorrow was done in real time. So you can still go back and see all the tweets, but it's no longer live. Um, and this is what inspired me to try, thank you Peggy, this is what inspired me to try uh, the experiment in my classroom. And it was interesting because what I did is I did have my students following it. Uh, one of the things that they mentioned was that they didn't think that the actors did a great job of using Twitter because they were using Twitter for some of the things that my students said they would have just used a text message for. So that brought up some really interesting sort of uh, critical thinking in the classroom. But they weren't too into following it. That wasn't something that really interested them. I found that what interested them a lot more was that, you know, doing their own version of it. But we did actually still connect with another classroom. And the classroom followed our tweets and then kind of critiqued what we did. So that added a new layer to the performance. So um, this was sort of where I got the idea. Everything was in modern English. Um, they did use links to uh, multimedia. And um, what else did they do? Like I said, it was done in real time. So the difference is with our class is we did it in quasi real time, but all, most of our tweets happened in the classroom, and I'll talk about that too. All right, so like I said, we did an experiment first where I tried this out with my friends on Twitter, and I'm briefly going to talk about how that happened. Um, if it goes too fast for you, don't really worry about it because I'm going to get into the nuts and bolts of how I did this with my students later. So over the course of a March break, I had this idea. The graphic that's on the website, which is super cool, that skull with all the text, that was actually made by one of my students, which was really cool. It's all of Hamlet's soliloquies uh, formed into the skull. So he's getting a lot of publicity. And uh, Brock, uh, he's, his name is public on here. He's uh, in university now studying graphic design. So I like to give him a shout out whenever I can. Um, I basically used a number of different Google tools to promote this. I, I tweeted about it. And over the course of the weekend, I basically got a whole group of people who were interested in trying this out, including Andy, who is uh, on here right now as Marcellus. He played Marcellus, one of the palace guards. Um, and then we basically got started. Uh, we used Google Docs to kind of organize everything. We used Google Calendars to plan out when we were going to tweet. Um, and uh, I just have some screenshots here of some of the media that we ended up using. Yes, I'm sorry, you are Marcellus, yes. Um, Marcellus ended up using a number of different multimedia uh, within our first experiment. And I'll show you an example of one of the things that he uploaded. It's pretty impressive. And one of the things that I'll talk about too is how even though Marcellus's character is not a major character in Hamlet, he was a major character in our production because he wanted to be. And that, that led to um, some really important discoveries for how I could use this in the classroom. So the one uh, picture that I have here is, um, is a picture that our, our actor who played Ophelia uploaded. And she just tweeted this picture. 
Um, in the bottom corner, I have a clipping from a fake newspaper. So yes, yeah, so Peggy's post said corkboard.me, which is something that I use. That's in the right. Uh, I tweeted out a link to it, and it was a condolence board for uh, old Hamlet who died. And people signed on, and they posted their condolences. And so I could post that and share that with other people. Um, and wall wisher is just another version of that. And I've used that for a number of different reasons in the classroom. But this is also something that you can include as part of this project, because you just have to tweet out the URL, and then people can participate. Wall wisher is great. It just sort of depends uh, on you know, what your browsers are like on your school computers, if you're using it in school. Sometimes wall wisher works better than corkboard and vice versa. So I use both different options. Oh, Stixie. I haven't heard about that one. Thanks for that, Karen. Um, the newspaper generator, Peggy, if you want to post the link for that, that's a lot of fun. And you can have a lot of fun with this with students of all age groups. You can basically paste in whatever text you want, and it makes it look like a clipping from a newspaper. So I, uh, I used this a number of times as kind of updates to post about um, uh, the political things that were happening within Denmark in Hamlet. Uh, I posted you know, about the death of old Hamlet. And, uh, and students can use that to kind of do you know, tabloid type things if they want to. It can be a good discussion about um, you know, how you, how, whether a source is believable or not. Just because it looks believable, is it? And all of those sorts of things. So we used a lot of multimedia in our initial experiment of this project. And we also used uh, multimedia in the classroom as well with our students. So the next one that I have here is a video that Marcellus uploaded. So Marcellus is the palace guard. And um, he created a video that was basically his helmet cam as he was doing surveillance on the sort of the castle barricades at night. And um, I did have some students who created kind of their own versions of this kind of thing. But um, Marcellus is one of those kind of level four students who always have to go above and beyond. So let me just quickly show you his video. I ended up using it as a teaser for my students as well to kind of get them excited. So here we go. Um, I'm going to paste this again and we'll do another web tour. Just check in. Are you putting your mic back on, Danica? Is no, sorry, I forgot to do that. <laughs> so what I was saying was, um, if if you're some of you guys are not getting the the web tour when we switch to that, all of the links will be posted in the live binder, and they're just quick videos, but you can look through them later. So Peggy's posted uh, Marcellus's video that he made with his helmet cam. My students love this; it cracks them up, and it also again got them excited about trying this experiment in our classroom too. Uh, yes. So the fake. The fake newspaper link, that is, uh, I don't know, Peggy's probably going to get there faster than I am, but here we go. There we are. So that link is the newspaper generator, and that should take you to, um, you can just paste in the text, whatever you want. And then it's embeddable. So if you have a blog or a website, you can embed them, which is what I did too. OK. So basically, the multimedia here is just to give you a sense of it doesn't have to just be text. Um, yes, Tammy, are these videos incorporated somehow linked? Yes, they are linked. So what we did was, in our initial experiment, as the characters from Hamlet were tweeting, they were also including the URLs to the multimedia. So they would say things like, watch this, look at this, or participate in this. So yes, they were, they were all amalgamated together. And again, this is what my, my Twitter friends did, but we did very similar things in the classroom, and your students could do the same thing as well. I'm just trying to show you that it doesn't just have to be the text. You can, you can pull in all kinds of Web 2.0 if you want. So we had a lot of fun with this. 
Um, and there were, again, remember I tried this just to see how I could use it in the classroom. And so here were the things that I discovered. So first of all, Twitter equalized all the characters. I did a lot of role playing in the classroom before. And if you've ever taught, you know, any kind of drama, it doesn't have to be Shakespeare, or even text, you've probably done some role playing in the classroom, which is great. And um, a students, I find, are much more willing to take risks and experiment if they're pretending to be someone else. However, getting up in front of the classroom can make people kind of uncomfortable. So this was um, a way to kind of even broaden that. The other thing is, too, is if they're reading the roles from the play, and Marcellus, for example, is a character who doesn't have very many lines. But on Twitter, because Marcellus was just thinking about how his character would respond to different circumstances, um, he would say things whenever it was relevant. It didn't matter that he didn't have a line in a particular scene. So initially it was kind of, you know, we were kind of performing Hamlet, but then as it evolved, it was people commenting on kind of what they were thinking about the actions that were taking place. So that was the thing that I ended up really focusing on in the classroom. I told my students, don't worry about trying to perform the play. Instead, think about how would your character respond to what's going on. And so then, it really didn't matter whether the character was on stage or not. They could participate as much as Hamlet. And it also meant that Hamlet didn't have a bigger job to do than one of the grave diggers, per se. Uh, so that was the second part. There are no small parts, only small actors. That famous cliche was very, very true in this project. You could participate as much as you want. Yes, you could see. You could pull it off via a blog. Um, and, and that would actually give you more freedom in terms of how long you wanted your post to be. I've done a similar kind of thing before using Ning, which is a social networking site. Um, and, and that, you know, a social networking site that you can personalize. So uh, that, that worked pretty well as well. There was something, though, about the, the kind of immediate real-time nature of Twitter that my students seem to find appealing. Patrick, I will talk to you about um, how and when we did this, because that's a really important question. Did they read it first, or was it simultaneous? First of all, it was simultaneous, and then I'll talk about kind of how I broke that up, because that was one of the tricky things to figure out, is when we would do the tweets. Um, okay. And were the Twitter names taken? Well, one of the things that I got to do is I got to recycle the Twitter names from our project, the initial one. I actually like borrowed the uh, Twitter accounts back from the people who used them initially. So none of them are, you can see like Marcellus's handles, Marcellus underscore 01. They're all variations. There are very few that are just, you know, Claudius or Hamlet. Um, but we'll have a link as well to my Twitter list so you can actually see what all of their handles were. Our Marcellus was a very poetic Marcellus. So this is how we did it in the classroom. This actually is a, a shot of one of my classes from the back, so it, uh, it does conceal their identity somewhat. Holly, it is kind of a BYOD classroom. I'll talk about that too a little bit later. So you can actually see in this shot, we've got a mix of devices. One of my students is using an iPhone, one of my students is using a school netbook, and one of my students is using his own laptop. So we have a real mix that I'll talk about a little bit later. One of the things that was important um, is starting with a big idea. Don't start with a, we're going to use Twitter because Twitter is cool. The big idea that I started with, and remember this is a grade 12 class, um, is they needed to have kind of a big idea that they were exploring throughout this activity. And the other thing to keep in mind is this was just part of what we did to study Hamlet. It wasn't a, a replacement for, you know, digging into the text and doing close readings and all of that stuff. So this was getting at one particular angle of the text. So I asked my students at the beginning of the project, what is the value of reimagining a text using social media? And by the end of it, you know, we talked about what they found. You know, so some of them thought that you know, initially what they thought might be the value was not actually what they got out of it by the end of it. And I'll talk about what we did get out of it. Um, when you're setting it up, and this is a lot you know, we get a lot of questions about this. How do you actually set this up? I feel as a teacher it's important for me to have access to all of the Twitter accounts. Now initially this is a bit of a pain 
setting up a Twitter account for each character. But then once you've done it, you can recycle it as many times as you want. So um, you have to have uh, a different email account for each Twitter handle. And so the easy way to do that is with Gmail. So if my Gmail address is danicabarker at gmail.com, I can create infinite Gmail addresses by going uh, danicabarker plus hamlet at gmail.com, danicabarker plus claudius at gmail.com. They all go to my Gmail address, but Twitter recognizes them as different email addresses. So that way I have control over every single account. Um, I can give the students, you know, I can change the password each year if I want to. The students have access to the password. It keeps it more transparent because, of course, remember, you can do direct messages in uh, Twitter. Yeah, you can't do too many accounts at once, Dorian. Uh, that's one of the things that I discovered too. So if you don't do them all at once, you do them in stages. It is, and you can also do, I think if you put a period in some place, so if I did Danica.Barker or Danica B. Arthur, you can make variations on the Twitter account that way. So that's sort of one of the, you know, little gems that I've discovered along the way. And creating a list is also important. One of the questions that people have had yeah, and 25 is more than enough, 25 different accounts. You don't need that many. Uh, I did 18 for Hamlet. So how were we going to organize the tweets? We talked about using hashtags. I didn't need to use a hashtag for this one because a hashtag then limits the number of characters that you can have in a tweet. Instead, what I did is I put all of the different usernames, all of the different Twitter handles onto a list. And so if we actually go to, I think I will do the web tour thing again, so I apologize for those of you who um, the web tour doesn't work for, but you can maybe just listen. This is in a video. So I'm just going to take you to the Twitter list for my class. And there's the link for it there. So if the web tour doesn't work, you can just click on it in the chat. So the very last tweet that you'll see, and I will talk about Storify in a moment. Storify is awesome is Hamlet's final tweet, the rest is silence. So you can actually click on that link too, and you can scroll through and you can see what all the tweets were. Um, and you'll see that um, you know, there's a lot of humor in this as well. And that's where the students wanted to go with it. They really enjoyed it. So um, you know, we, we went with it. And you can actually, on the list then, you can actually go to the list page. Let's just see here. Uh, by members. You can see there are 18 different members and you can actually see um, what, you know, what, their, what their profiles look like, what their pictures look like, and the kinds of things that they posted. Okay. Yeah, their hashtag comments, they had so much fun. So you can see, you know, political corruption of laws, um, you people have issues. And that was a way that they really kind of put their own stamp on things. They loved it. They had so much fun. Our grave diggers were hilarious. They were real characters. Um, in my first, you know, experiment, our Marcellus was the real character. In my classroom experiment, it was definitely the grave diggers. And they tweeted all the way through, even though they just, um, you know, in the play, they only appear in one scene. So. The thing with Twitter, of course, is the most recent tweet is on top, and then you have to scroll backwards. But with Storify, so let me just, um, uh, I don't have my own, I don't think I have my own Storify page. But with Storify, you can actually choose how you want the, um, the tweets to look. So you can make it go, you can flip the order around, you can kind of edit the tweet so that they appear in whatever order you want, or if somebody did kind of a, a tweet that wasn't very good that you didn't like, so this is Storify here, you can uh, choose how you want it to appear, which is really great. And then it actually lets you embed um, the Storify links in your blog or in your website. So if people aren't on Twitter and you want to share the tweets with other people, it's a really great way to do that. So you can share with parents what you've been doing even if they don't have Twitter accounts. It's a lot of fun. So that's what I actually did. So if you go to um, one of the links that I have on here is actually my grade 12 class blog because I have different blogs for all of my classes. And then if you go to the 
here. Um, if you go to the page within my class blog for the, um, uh, the projects that we did, you'll see a storified version of, of all of the tweets. This is a screenshot, actually, too. So here you go. This is a screenshot of Storify. So rather than having to read it from the bottom to the top, you can switch it around to read it from the top to the bottom. So I posted them all on our class blog in different apps. And then what we could do is we could actually go through it as a class and look at all the tweets and kind of critique them and say, you know, is this how you understood the character? Oh, thank you, Peggy. That's great. Did you under, does, does this make sense to you? Because there was a lot of debate about, for example, Gertrude's character. You know, did, was she really a caring mother, or was she actually in on the murder of old Hamlet? And uh, that was, and this is the thing that I, I kind of wanted to really get at, that that was the biggest thing that we got out of the whole presentation, I think, or the whole experiment in the classroom, was that the, the biggest value we found was not in the actual tweeting, but in the conversations my students had before they tweeted. So here's where we get into, um, oh, what a great question, Shambles. So did we have inanimate objects tweet? We didn't. Um, I never really had enough students that you know, we needed to sort of create those other roles, but you totally could. Like you could have um, you know, the poison wine goblet tweeting, or you can, you can do whatever you want. That's great. I love that. So, the biggest thing was using tweeting is an actual reading strategy. So this is where we get into a lot of the questions about when, how, how do we do this. So we did it simultaneously with studying the play. So I would say, as we are reading this act or this particular scene, I want you to think about how your character would respond to what's going on. So even if your character hasn't entered into the play yet, these events are going to affect you somehow. How would they affect you? What would you be tweeting about? And so as they're reading, they're thinking about that. We would finish reading the scene. They would get together in groups, and then they would talk about it. So the first semester when I did this, I had a very small class, and I didn't have very many of the students paired up. I really learned from that, because then by the second time around, actually when I had a bigger class and I just had to pair people up, it made for really good discussions, because students had to talk to each other before they could tweet, because they had to agree on what they were going to tweet about. And those discussions were so valuable. They really dug deep into the subtext. Um, there was some great critical thinking going on. They had some fantastic debates about the character, about the themes, about the larger issues involved in the play. I mean, they were bringing in all of the stuff that we did on you know, notes on the great chain of being, or notes on you know, history and, and all of these things. They had to pull those in in order to do you know, even a 10-character tweet. So a lot of people initially thought when I was doing this that it was going to be very superficial and kind of gimmicky. And I was worried myself that it might be that. But those powerful discussions you know, really quelled any fears that I had about it being superficial. It was so valuable. And I mean, if I can, if I can stress anything to you, you could even do this entire exercise without doing the tweeting. Of course, having those tweets is something that's really fun for the students in the end to be able to go back and look at them. But just to have that framing discussion, how would this affect your character? If you were going to tweet about it after, what would you say? It's huge. So I think I stressed that enough. Um, now, when exactly did the tweeting happen? So usually what happened was we, we didn't do it every day, um, usually once or twice a week. So at the start of the period, I would say, OK, so this is going to be our tweeting day. So as we read the scene, I want you to think about it, and we would have the discussion. Um, and then at the end of the period, usually for the last 15 minutes or so, that's when the actual tweeting would happen. So I would work in time. These are 75-minute periods, just so you know. I'd work in time for students to discuss, and then we'd tweet. And then we didn't have any time to discuss the tweets at the end of class. So the next day, I'd aggregate all of the tweets using Storify, put them on the blog. We'd just log into the blog, and we would look at it. So I put it up on our data projector. I don't have a smart board or anything like that, but I do have a data projector in the classroom. And then we would just look at them, and we would talk about them. And that, was, that added so much to our study of the play, because um, it gave them something that they were personally invested in. So it was something they were involved in. So they really did care about the discussions. They got, oh yeah, they were great exit cards, Kristen. They were great exit cards. 
um, it, it got them, you know, personally invested in the project. And that's one of the biggest problems I find with teaching, you know, classic texts is how do we get the students personally involved in them? And I think there are lots of different ways to do them. This was just one of those ways that we got in there. And um, there was a question about, is this a BYOD classroom? My school does have Wi-Fi. It's uh, the student network for Wi-Fi is a fairly new thing. Um, I didn't need to have, first of all, in a class of 30 people, I really only needed to have, you know, 10 to 15 devices because my students were all paired up. They didn't all need to tweet at the same time either because while some of the students were tweeting, the others were still having discussions about what they were going to tweet. Um, within my school, we've got a class set of netbooks, and that's 20 netbooks, so it's not enough for everybody in my class but I didn't need them. Um, so we had a combination of, there were one or two students who brought in their own laptops. Uh, pretty much everyone had a cell phone, so they could choose to use their cell phones for this particular project if they wanted to. Whereas my administrator scared. No, um, I've been using technology in the classroom for a while now, and I have, we have a school policy about things like cell phones in the classroom. And, uh, you know, in a nutshell, they're not allowed in the classroom unless the teacher has specifically given permission for that for a specific learning activity. And so this was our learning activity. So you could pull it out for this and then put it away. And um, I mean, that whole discussion about using cell phones in the classroom, there are tons of other discussions about it. I can basically tell you that it was no more of an issue for me than, you know, passing notes in class. But that's, you know, that's another story altogether. So we do have a, but I mean, we didn't have to use cell phones either. Uh, a lot of the students preferred the desktop version of Twitter. So even though they had cell phones, a lot of them preferred to use uh, one of the netbooks to actually access Twitter. It's easier to post links that way too. So yeah, so I mean, I guess my point is, is that you don't have to have a class lab. You don't have to have a set of 30 computers. I mean, really, you could even do it with one you know, uh, PC that you have in the classroom if you wanted to and just take turns signing in. How would you do this with freshmen? So I think freshmen is that uh, like grade nine, so sort of 13, 14 year olds. I would do it exactly the same way. I would probably not use, um, I don't know, depending on, on sort of where we were in the semester and how much I could trust my kids. I probably wouldn't use cell phones. Uh, I might actually, you know, book a lab for that day and have them come in and uh, because, again, we weren't doing it every day. We were doing it once or twice a week. And it was only for about 15 minutes. So it actually was quite manageable. I think if you want to do it, there are lots of different workarounds that you can find that work for your students. And you can sort of tailor the amount of um, uh, freedom that you give the students based on how much freedom you know as a teacher you can give them. With my grade 12s, I was able to give them lots of freedom. And they didn't abuse it. But again, this wasn't the very first thing that we did in the year two. So, uh, you know, it takes time to establish those relationships, and we did this a little bit later on in the semester. And working in, yes, working in partners or small groups, I find that you do have, uh, it, it's, it's more effective, actually, than having them work on their own. One of the biggest things that we learned, and I feel like I've already stressed this, is that it's not about the performance itself, but it's about what happens in the wings or backstage. It's about the stuff that you don't see. Some of the biggest gems that we got were the, the conversations that happen between characters who may never actually meet on the stage. And for me, I mean, that, if people have asked me, you know, how do you know that your students actually understood the play if you didn't do content quizzes all the time? And I said, well, if you go back through and you look at the threads of discussions, you can see that they understood because they had to understand in order to uh, talk to each other, in order to tweet and, and to make sure they're not contradicting things that happened in the play. And um, that for me is a much more authentic reason to, to know the facts of the play, then, you know, you have to know the facts because you're going to do a content quiz on Monday. So whether you decide to do, you know, Twitter or something else, for me it's about those authentic reasons for, for studying something. And I feel like they were really able to get a deeper understanding of the play by doing this. And like I said, this was just one aspect that we used for studying the play. And it really, for me, enriched a lot of the other things that they did in the classroom. I mean, 
they, they've said so too. I've actually, you know, taken students from my class to present in a, a pre-service faculty of ed class, and, and they sort of talked about what they learned from it. And I, I mean, the fact that they got to have a lot of fun and throw in some personal expression there too is definitely a, an engagement hook. The last thing that I want to say before we get into questions is that you shouldn't mark this or grade this. Now, you can choose to if you want to, but I mean, for me, uh, I wasn't going to mark the tweets because that wasn't the expectation, the curriculum expectation that I was marking. I did throw in some communication marks for the discussions that they had before they tweeted. Um, but you don't have to grade everything that you do in order to get them to do it. I know that that's sometimes a tough sell, but if you tell them that you're going to be grading you know, the, the discussion, then that takes the anxiety out of the fact that they have to tweet because some of them have never tweeted before and that makes them really nervous. And if you tell them you're going to be marking it, that really um, shuts down the tweeting that happens. So I wanted them to just feel free to take risks, make mistakes without being graded on this. Um, and uh, I found that they were a lot, yeah, it is so much about the process for this. I had lots of other different ways that I could get marks. And um, it, it, I didn't need to say I was going to mark it in order to get them to participate. The fact that they were working with partners, I mean, some of the kids in the class never wrote a single tweet, but they all participated in the conversation. So if I did have one or two students who said, you know, I'm just, I'm really not comfortable tweeting even though I'm not using my own name. I said, no problem. You're partnered up with somebody else. Let that person do the tweeting. And so everybody was still participating, even if they didn't all want to tweet. And I think that that's, you know, an important little nugget to take away from this too. So that's my part of the presentation done. And so I guess I can turn it over to uh, my other host here if you wanted to, I don't know, take questions. I'm not quite sure how this part works. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Danica. Um, I only took down one question that I saw is, um, can you use back channels without having a Twitter account? Oh, totally. Like something like Today's Meet. Maybe if somebody wants to put that in the chat. Um, Today's Meet is a back channel that people can use. It's just a chat box, basically. Um, and you can use that if you don't want to create Twitter accounts for all the different people. The only thing is I've had some bad experiences with um, Today's Meet. Because people can log in with whatever name they want, there is some lack of accountability. Um, and I found that I preferred to use the Twitter handles because then there's some accountability. I know who's tied to each username. So you want to kind of balance the anonymity with accountability. I feel like that's sort of the, the, the really important factor there is a little bit of anonymity gets students to take risks. Um, too much anonymity means that they might not behave as responsibly as they should. So I feel like there's a fine line. Uh, Steve talked about Moodle. I don't use Moodle, so I'm sure that there's a possibility that you use chat and Moodle. Um, and again, like the tool itself, the fact that it's Twitter doesn't matter so much as the fact that uh, you're getting them to have conversations <coughs> and then post them. With younger students, you could do the fake Facebook pages and have the conversations that way as well. Absolutely. And I mean, I've seen, I know Aviva has used Today's Meet um, as kind of, so did you kind of similar role playing with her grade one students. And so that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, and it, it, it worked out really well for her. I think it's, it's a lot simpler. And I mean, there are a lot fewer steps involved. And, and you can still kind of, you know, you can take a, yeah, she uses Twitter as well. She uses everything. <laughs> so there yeah. are lots of different things that you could use for that. And shamblespad.com, Shambles is offering that back channel tool as well for pri public or private use as well. I, Titanpad yeah. is another one, titanpad.com. Sure. I think one of the things that uh, the kids really liked with Twitter, and I mean, because we're working with older groups, is they had really just started using Twitter. So I mean, there was that aspect of it that was appealing. But they did like the, um, the fact that they could upload a picture and they could, you know, give it some personality. So they liked that there was like a, an identity associated with it. Um, Robin was asking about what a back channel tool is. And it's really any sort of 
we call it a back channel because it's sort of the discussion that happens behind the scenes. But the chat that we're doing right here where you guys are talking about stuff as I'm presenting, that's a back channel. And there are lots of tools that you can use for that. Yeah, I can stick around for a little bit for questions even though I know we're officially done. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and officially close out the show, but we invite you to stick around if you have time, everyone. But we know that uh, you do need to go, some of you, and uh, we want to be respectful of your time. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and close out the show. And we want to let you know that Steve Hargadon will be interviewing um, Tony Wagner on the 28th and Michael Strong on the 30th, and Ronald Walk on September 4th, and all of those will be at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern. So uh, if you can join him at those times, and his sessions are always great interviews with Steve Hargadon that you'll always um, get a lot out of those sessions. <clears throat> We will not have a session on September 1st, um, but we want to let you know about September 8th that we will have TJ Shea and some of the other Fable Vision ambassadors talking about International Dot Day with Peter Reynolds, who wrote the, the book of, uh, about the Dot Day. And uh, if you're a Fable Vision ambassador, please join us, and if not, please, uh, um, if you are an ambassador, please invite other ambassadors to join us. That's going to be a great, great one. And we always send out um, reminders through Classroom 2.0. So if you're the, in the part of the Classroom 2.0 name, you'll get the reminder. On the 15th, we'll be talking about the Class Dojo Behavior Management Tool. And September 22nd, we're going to, uh, we're looking for a featured teacher. So please list some of the featured teachers uh, that you would like to nominate. As well as September the 29th, uh, we're going to have David Trust on. And this is the form, as well as you can put it on the survey that's going to open up automatically, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But at any time, you can nominate a, a featured teacher. Any educator that works with teachers, colleagues, um, educators of any kind, or students, you can nominate them by going to tinyurl.com slash cr20live featured teacher, N-O-M-I-N-A-T. And we would love to have you suggest some great educators for us. And once you exit today's session, the survey will automatically open in a browser for you. And if for any reason it doesn't, you can always go to tinyurl.com slash cr20live survey. Or if you watch one of the re um, recordings, you can always type in that URL as well and suggest future guests, future topics, or request one of the professional development certificates. And Peggy will send that out to you. Just make sure you include your name and your email address. You can also click on that link right now, and it will open in your browser. Um, and you won't be disconnected from the session, but it will open in your browser and you can bookmark it for future reference. Also, we have an iTunes U channel that you can subscribe to. You can go to tinyurl.com slash cr20live. You'll notice everything starts the same. And then iTunes U all together. You can subscribe to the video, which are the MP4s and the audio, the MP3 collection. And you can subscribe to either or or both and take us with you wherever you go. You can also subscribe to the RSS feed, which is on our archives and resources page that Peggy, um, that's on our 
blog in our website and we'll put that it's off it's right there in our chat that Peggy just posted on our website and you can uh, subscribe that way and get all of the resources as well as the live binder link and you can uh, subscribe that way if you didn't want to use the or if you wanted the extra resources in addition to the iTunes U channel. So you have a variety of ways to get all of the resources that we share each and every week. And we wanted to especially thank Danica for joining us today and Steve Hargadon for, um, he's the founder of Classroom 2.0. And we want to uh, especially thank Weebly and each of you for participating each and every week and commenting and sharing your links with us and Blackboard for providing this forum for us to meet. And so we're going to go ahead and pass it back to questions. The only question I had was about the VEC channel. Uh, Lori, did you have a question that I, did you see any questions that I might have missed? I'm not sure. Oh. I'm not hearing you, Lori. So um, maybe it's just me. But um, is it any time that you watch that Peggy posted that you watch an iTunes that you watch a recording and um, through iTunes you, and you would like a certificate, you can just go to that survey uh, URL and request a certificate and Peggy will send that out to you. And then you can uh, turn in your certificate and see if it's accepted by your district and your school. And Shimmel says lots of back channel tools that you can explore at any time. He's got great links that you can explore on his website. Um, I, I did a webinar on, okay. Yeah, Shambles has so much and I'm not sure what I did a webinar on, but I guess I did. Um, Are there any other questions that I might have missed throughout this session? We want to make sure, and if, or if you have additional questions, please uh, type those in the chat before we let Danica go and uh, enjoy the rest of her weekend. If not, you can take the mic. We're welcome. We'll be happy to do that. We do post our chat log. It's separate from the live binder. Our chat log is on our archives and resources channel uh, page on our website. And you can find that that will be posted this weekend as well. And all of those links um, and resources can be found. The chat log with the links Okay, I thought I copied it correctly, but I guess I didn't. The uh, here's the page for our archives. There we go. Thank you, Peggy. Um, that's where you can find the chat log, and that will be posted in a little bit, as well as the link to the full recording 
and then later on we'll be posting the MP, MP4. Um, and later on this weekend we'll be posting the iTunes U channel as well. But um, I think the, the iPad uh, app only works if you have um, a Blackboard account through the, an LMS account. And Shambles, let me give you the mic. Shambles, go ahead. Hi, oh, I'm just switching on my um, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, but I, I, I suspect it's just something that could be done their end. So it might be worth just asking Steve if he can twist some arms and uh, and get these the sessions that we're having now, these these live sessions in this particular room, uh, enabled for mobile because it would be good for people to be able to play. I suspect what it will do, from looking to my experience this evening, is that uh, it will give you a different address to the room. There'll be some little code missing in the room, that's all. But I think you're absolutely right that it's initially designed to be used with private paid for rooms. But twist his arm, see if you can get him to, uh, to to get it enabled. It would be lovely for people to be able to play here on the iPad. That's all. Thank you. He might, we can talk to him. Uh, since he doesn't work for them anymore, I'm not sure how much of a connection he has, but it's worth a try. And Kai, did you have a question? Let's see. Go ahead. You have the mic now. Did you want to use your mic to? Okay. There you go. Okay. Well, it looks like our questions have uh, kind of uh, dwindled and. I did read that the only ones that, that were going to be able to use the iPad account were those who had um, an account through an institution that used the LMS. So that's what I read about the iPad account uh, for the, on the mobile devices. But we do hope that you will join us. We won't be next week, but uh, we will be back the following week for another exciting presentation where we'll be talking about the uh, class dojo management um, and it, their yeah, I'm sure that there is hopefully. Um, yeah, it's a USA holiday, Labor Day holiday, where uh, it's a Monday where nobody's supposed to work, but people do. Some people do work. They have a lot of uh, shopping sales. So some people uh, have off on the Labor Day holiday, and some people do not have off on the Labor Day holiday. It's kind of a strange shambles of who has off and who doesn't have off. But yes, it is a U USA holiday. So, uh, but a lot of people go on vacation and go uh, out of town, and, and uh, it's the last uh, holiday before um, it's the last holiday before the official end of summer. So that's why uh, people go out of town and take off. So we will see everybody back after next Saturday and thank you so much everybody for joining us today yeah our clocks will be changing uh, I think that's not till October or November till November they changed it it used to be uh, shortly thereafter yeah there you go and uh, we hope you have a wonderful weekend everybody and rest up from the week of uh, learning 2.0 conference. I'm sure um, there's. If you didn't get to attend, there were some great, great sessions. 
that um, if you didn't attend, you can um, next Saturday you can attend some of those sessions in place of ours. Um, they were fantastic. So take care, everybody. Um, hope to see you online during the week and have a fantastic, fantastic weekend. Take care. Everybody.